welcome back to the next lecture in the course on transport processes in biological systems. Okay. In the previous class we looked at the importance of rates why we need to look at things in terms of rates mass rate rather than mass uh, and rates of conserved quantities especially. Okay. Let us move, move forward and um, before that we said we would look at mass conservation itself for some time to begin with in this course because it is a very important and useful concept. Okay. Let us continue from there. Mass balance is an important principle as has been beaten <laughs> to you uh, many times in this course already, a few more will come. This of course is based on the law of conservation of mass which says that total mass is constant as long as we do not deal with nuclear reactions where mass to energy conversion is possible or we do not travel at speeds close to that of light. To apply material balance mass balance we need to do it a certain way for it to be uh, effective or easy to apply. Usually uh, always not usually always we need to apply the mass balance over a system. A system is nothing but an aspect that we focus on it could be as large as say the entire country or uh, the entire earth or it could be um, the entire building, the entire university or it could be as small as your pen, your body or it could be even smaller as a cell and so on and so forth. As long as it is a continuum system you could choose that as your system. Okay. That is what a system is, something that you focus your attention on, it could be whatever. The choice of the system is depends on what you want to do and the appropriate choice comes only with practice. You will need to get into it, you will need to practice a lot before you feel comfortable. So, for the initial stages just look at what has been chosen as a system as we go along and then as you do more and more aspects as more and more problems and so on and so forth, you will get accustomed to choosing a system. In some cases choice of a system can be very tricky to get the exact thing that we are looking for that is uh, even for people who are very experienced. Okay. So, it is not a very easy thing to do, but uh, we will we'll get there ultimately. So, for now let us say that um, we are going to focus on a particular aspect and that aspect is shown by what is inside these dotted lines. These dotted lines give the periphery of the aspect that we need to focus on. So, that is our system, this dotted line represents the boundaries of a system. There could be various inputs to the system and there could be various outputs to the system of mass that is, because we are looking at the mass conservation that is the conserved quantity that we are looking at. If we follow the mass of a species, only the following can happen to the species in this context of the system and inputs and outputs. The species comes into the system, it crosses the system boundaries and comes into the system at a rate of r i. It is output from the system at a rate of r o. Note that I am talking of rates, I am not talking of amounts. Rates r o it could be generated in the system at the rate of r g or it could be consumed in the system at a rate of r c. These are the four things that will happen to a species or mass of a species. Okay. You can think as much as you want, whatever happens can be categorized into one of these four. Okay. So, the net rate is nothing but from the point of view of the system is nothing but the rate of input of that mass into the system minus the rate of output of that mass through the various streams from the system plus the rate of generation of the same species minus the rate of consumption of that species. That is the net rate of that species in that system inside the system. So, the net rate is the rate at which the species mass gets accumulated in the system. Okay. The net rate is going to determine 
how the species mass is going to either increase or decrease with time in the system. In other words, d d t of m the rate at which mass changes with time this is the uh, you know a little bit of calculus therefore, you know that this is the standard way to represent the rate of change of a substance of a quantity with another quantity in this case the rate of change of mass with time. So, r i minus r o plus r g minus r c is the rate of change of mass of that species in that system with time. Okay. This is the useful form of the material balance principles that can be directly applied to various processes, bioprocesses and so on and so forth. Okay. Just remember this, you go to a process, you blindly apply this, you will not go wrong. Okay. Wherever you are, just make sure that you are not dealing with nuclear reactions or you are not traveling at speeds of uh, speeds close to that of light, you will be perfectly fine, this would always be valid and that is very powerful and that is what this course is giving you, it will give you a few such things. It is giving you a principle that can be applied anywhere, anytime to anything and it will be valid, okay. that is something very powerful. You do not have many such things by the way. Okay. What we are going to do now is to apply this principle okay, uh, to a macroscopic system in this case. I okay. will uh, call this a reflection point or a practice point. I may term it as that or I may implicitly think that it is that you would be able to figure out very easily. Okay. So, we are at these points where you strengthen your understanding, you do a bit of calculation maybe or you think about something essentially you strengthen your understanding. So, what we are going to do is we are going to apply this principle the useful form of the material balance. Material balance is nothing but mass can either be created or destroyed or mass is conserved. So, we use that over a system uh, undergoing a process to get it of a form that can be useful to us right? and that is what we are going to apply. Uh, in useful to us just means that it has been presented in terms of quantities that can be measured that is essentially what it means. I will also mention this again. For this let us consider this problem. A humidifier is fed with dry air, the dry air means no water vapor is present. The water vapor is removed during the processing of air to avoid contamination of the bioreactor. Okay, because there could be organisms present in the air, moist air especially. In the bioreactor, we want only the organism of, of interest of for us to grow and nothing else. And the way we make sure of that is we first um, sterilize the bioreactor space, uh, make sure that everything gets killed, all uh, microorganisms are killed and then very carefully we introduce the microorganism of interest to us into the bioreactor space in maybe in a liquid medium and then allow that to grow all the time ensuring that nothing can no other organism can get in. If you are supplying oxygen through air um, and uh, we have uh, the organisms that are present in the air that could very easily get in and contaminate a system, we do not want that to happen in a production system. So, that is uh, what we do. So, the water vapor uh, is removed to create this dry air during the processing to avoid contamination of the bioreactor and clean liquid water is also added to the humidifier. Think about why we really need to use a humidifier. Okay. What is a humidifier? A humidifier is something that adds humidity that adds moisture to something. Okay. You would have all uh, you may be familiar with something uh, the things called hu uh, room humidifiers they are machines you pour some water they spray a fine mist of liquid water into the dry space and the humidity of the room increases and we feel more comfortable in very dry climates okay, that is what a humidifier is. In this case why do we need that think about it take maybe pause the video here and think about it. Okay. Let me give you the answer, hopefully you thought about it, uh, maybe this uh, this is what you thought about also. 
we removed the moisture from the air to prevent contamination that is fine. However, the air has a certain capacity to carry moisture. If it does not have that amount which is supposed to be naturally present, you can use the modern mix to figure out how much should be actually naturally present there, the vapor liquid equilibrium concepts and so on and so forth, you can go back and look at that. You can actually predict very accurately how much there is going to be, that is what relative humidity is all about. You have air, we will get back, we have air uh, from which the moisture has been stripped to avoid contamination and then you have cleaned the air, it has gone through various filters. Now, if we put it into the bioreactor broth, which is all liquid water, it is start going to take liquid from the bioreactor broth to satisfy its need to carry a certain amount of uh, moisture under the given conditions of temperature and pressure, okay. because that is its source. Whenever it comes into contact with that source, it is going to start pulling out the water. If it is going to pull out the water, the water level in the bioreactor is going to reduce because a good amount of evaporation is going to take place into the dry air. And once that starts happening, maybe the probes will get exposed, uh, you know the probes are no longer reading what they are supposed to do, they are no longer submerged in the liquid. The water level keeps on going and things get concentrated to uh, levels that are far beyond acceptable and probably within a couple of days, you may not have any liquid left in a small bioreactor. That is the reason why we need to add moisture to probably equilibrium amounts back into the dry air before we feed it into the bioreactor broth. Thereby, we have saturated the air with whatever moisture it is supposed to carry. It will not strip the bioreactor of the moisture uh, of the liquid and the, the liquid level will remain pretty much constant. So, this is the reason why uh, we use a humidifier. Let us move further. The liquid water flow rate is 18 cc per minute. If 5 percent, 5 mole percent of oxygen are needed in the output stream of the humidifier for supply to the bioreactor, let us determine the molar rate at which air should be supplied to the humidifier when it operates at steady state. You all know that steady state means that prop properties of interest at a particular point do not change with time in the system. Okay. That is essentially what steady state is, you must have picked this up earlier. If not, you can learn now. Uh, you take any property of interest to us, it does not change in that system, uh, in that point in the system with time. Okay. The unchanging nature with time is essentially what steady state is, but at a particular point, okay. remember this. So, this is the problem, think about this problem or uh, let me also present a figure to help you understand. So, this is the humidifier here. You have uh, air that is coming in, dry air that is coming in, water that is probably sprayed into the humidifier, so that it saturates the air hopefully, uh, that we are not really interested in that. And then whatever is coming out here, the product needs to have 0 0.05, the mole fraction needs to be 0 0.05, this translates to 5 mole percent, therefore the mole fraction of oxygen in the product needs to be 0.05. The, this is the um, statement that is, that is made. You go ahead and think about this, try to do this problem. When we, should we do this? Yeah, probably I will present the solution for this and then take a break. Yeah, that might be a little better. Uh, pause the video here, think about this, read the problem a couple of times and then let us see uh, whether you are able to do this. Uh, do not take too much time because I am going to give you some hints towards problem solving itself next and that I think should be done right away, so that it will help you the best way. In, in any case, pause the video for maybe a minute or two, read the problem, try to get a feel for the problem and then we will continue. Go ahead please. Okay, hopefully you uh, got a feel for the uh, the problem. What I am going to do now is tell you something about problem solving itself. We are going to solve a lot of closed ended problems in this course as a part of the course itself uh, to help you get better with the understanding and so on and so forth. 
there would be assignments where you need to solve problems and therefore, it is good to pick up some aspects of problem solving. Having said that, I should right away say that problem solving is a higher level skill. What do I mean by that? In learning, there are various levels at which one can learn. If one follows what is called the Bloom's taxonomy of learning objectives, things can be learned at a stage where you just recall them, okay, you memorize, you recall them. So, that is the recall stage. The next stage or let me say recall is the most surface level stage. The next stage of depth is the understanding stage, we have understood the material. The next level of depth is the, ap is the apply stage, where you can apply the information. The next level of depth is the analyze level, the next level of depth is the evaluate level, the next level of depth is the create level. So, any subject can be learnt at any level of depth here. It is best that you learn it at the level of uh, the, the deepest level of uh, learning possible, which is the create level, but uh, different courses are different, they will take you through uh, different levels of learning. We try to get to at least the level of uh, evaluation and creation in my courses, in my direct contact courses, I go to the level of creation all the way uh, down, uh, you know, the deepest level possible through various exercises. In this format, that may not be so easy to achieve, but we will probably get to the level of analysis and evaluation even in this kind of a format. So, problem solving is a higher level skill, it, higher level skill means deeper level skill, with, which means it needs a, the skill in analysis, it needs a civil skill in evaluation, in creation and so on and so forth. So, it is not easy to do, okay. that is something that you need to understand. It, you need not be worried that you are unable to solve problems right away, you will not be able to. You need to develop those skills before you are able to solve the problem, that is what I mean. There are some books, nice books, this is a slightly old book it is called strategies for creative problem solving. This is by Scott Fogler and Stephen Leblanc, it is a nice book, you can read this book, uh, if you can lay your hands on that, check out your library and so on and so forth, you could buy this book, this book is available uh, or you could read other books too, this is something that I have uh, read and found useful to recommend. We will focus on closed ended problem solving alone, which is a very small aspect of problem solving. Open ended problem solving is much larger, much more difficult. Closed ended problem solving. This is my recipe to you. Level 0, get a feel of the situation by reading the problem a few times. Okay. Then ask the question, what is needed? What is given or known? Okay, I am just presenting it as 1 and 2, sometimes you could ask this first and then ask that next and so on, do not be very strict about following that. But whatever what is given known must be clear, what is needed must be very clear, it is good to start with what is needed and then ask the question, how do we connect the needs with the givens and knowns, this is what we need, this is what we know, how do you connect the two, that is uh, in essence problem solving, right, closed standard problem solving. In other words, are there any principles that we can rely on to do this connection? Now, let us do this, let us be with this a couple of times, read this a couple of times, sorry, read this a couple of times, be with that for some time to get a feel of what it is. Okay. Let me read this at least for you. A humidifier is fed with dry air, which has no water vapor, the water vapor has been removed during the processing of air to avoid contamination to the bioreactor. So, the humidifier is fed with dry air and clean liquid water. The liquid water flow rate is 18 cc per minute, liquid water flow rate is 18 cc per minute. If 5 mole percent of oxygen are needed in the output stream of the humidifier for supply to the bioreactor later, let us determine the molar flow rate at which air should be supplied to the humidifier when the humidifier operates at steady state. Okay. Steady state operation is very standard that is the state at, at which many continuous things operate, okay. you would like to be in that state, otherwise the control becomes difficult and so on. 
So, at it is operating at steady state and you want to find out the molar flow rate of air given the molar flow rate, flow rate of water and the composition of water in the stream. This is completely water, this is completely dry air, there is no moisture in this. This is the situation. So, you can look at it uh, some more till you feel comfortable with it and that I think is essential, you need to feel comfortable with it. Now that you are comfortable with it, let us ask this question. Get a feel of the situation by reading it a few times, we did that, what is needed? It is clear that the molar flow rate of air at the outlet of the, at the inlet of the humidifier is needed, this has to be inlet. What is given? Flow rates and compositions of some streams are given. How do we connect the needs with the givens and knowns or are there any principles that we can rely on? Of course, mass balance principle is something that we can rely on and that we can use to connect the needs of the given, uh, the needs with the givens or the knowns. So, this is the material balance here. So, this is the essential thinking. Once you are clear about this, then the rest is processing. Uh, you will have to uh, somewhat mechanically do that with this in the background, then things will be fine. If you just start doing the process without the clarity in this, it is rather difficult to solve any problem, especially closed ended problems and that is what most of you face when you try to solve problems for the first time without experience. So, it is recommended to do the above explicitly while solving closed ended problems. We may or may not do explicitly uh, this procedure in this course, do not worry about it, we would mostly do it implicitly in this course, but keep this in mind, always ask the question. Uh, I mean, do I have a picture of this, then what is needed, what is known, whatever order and then how do I connect the needs to the unknowns or uh, needs to the knowns, uh, given on the knowns to get at the what is needed. Let me present the solution and stop here uh, for this lecture. We are going to work with moles because we need the molar flow rates. Typically, mass is the most comfortable to work in. Moles can change, moles of a species can change during a reaction, and therefore, moles are not as general, moral rates are not as general in applicability as mass rates. But here, that is not the case. Take it from me that uh, I have ensured that that is not the case. Therefore, we can work with moles itself. Uh, if you are not clear about that, it is better to work with mass and then convert mass and moles and so on and so forth. How do we convert from mass to moles? We know that, that by the definition of mole, it is nothing but the mass of a species divided by its molecular mass. So, uh, mass by molecular mass, if there is no change in the species, say due to a reaction during the process, the mole balances on individual species are as good as the mass balances. That I know in this case. If you are not sure, just use masses. Here, we will use moles. Dry air, we know, is made up of 21 percent oxygen and 79 percent nitrogen by volume or by mole, okay, uh, you know this. Of course, we are ignoring the minor components of air such as carbon dioxide uh, and the other minor gases we are ignoring. This is what it contains, this is dry air, otherwise it contains a good amount of moisture H 2 in it. The dry air is 21 percent oxygen and 79 percent nitrogen by mole. The molar flow rates of oxygen and nitrogen in the, in the air stream can be written as, remember the air stream was this. The air stream is this, the molar flow rate of air, this is the water stream and this is the product stream. So, the air stream, the molar flow rate uh, of oxygen is 0.21 times the molar flow rate of air because the mole fraction is 0.21. Let us call this equation 1.3 point dash 1. This might look a little surprising to you, but there is a reason why I do this here. It is always good to number equations whenever we work out something, whenever we do a derivation, whenever we work out the solution to problems, it is always good to number equations. And in this course that is being presented here, I am going to number the equations that are the same as in the textbook. Okay. So, that is the reason why it looks a little odd. This has a certain order in the textbook and that order brings it the number. Uh, chapter 1, section 3, the first equation of that, that is what this means. So, 
just to make sure it is easy for you to go and refer to the book, I am going to use the same equation number, although it might look a little odd, it might not look continuous and so on and so forth in this course. Please ignore the continuity part of the equations. It is nice to number equations continuously, but for this bigger reason, I am going to sacrifice continuity in numbering for ease of reference in the textbook. So, thus it may not be continuous, but it will be help more helpful to the students. Coming back to this problem, the molar flow rate of nitrogen in the air is 0.79 is 1 minus 0 0.21 that is 0.79 times the molar flow rate of air equation 1.3 dash 2. Mass rate is nothing but the volume rate times density we have already seen that. The density of water is 1 gram per cc remember that that number 1 gram per centimeter cubed. The flow rate of water is 18 cc per minute that is 18 grams per minute you know the um, cc the um, volume is 18 cc, the density is 1 gram per cc, therefore the mass flow rate has become 18 grams per minute. The molecular mass of water is 18 gram per mole and therefore the molar flow rate of water from the data that has been given is 1 mole per minute. There has to be a per minute here, it is 1 mole per minute. Okay, remember this. So, we have this, let us continue. Now, we will do mass balances to find the molar flow rate of air that is needed in the input. We are doing the analysis at steady state and we said by the definition of steady state there cannot be variation of the property of interest with time and therefore, any time derivatives in the system need to be put to 0. That is the mathematical meaning of a steady state. Therefore, you would not have any derivatives in the equation, you can, you can put any time derivatives in the equation, you can put them all to 0. So, you have this is the useful form of the mass balance equation input rate plus input rate minus output rate plus generation rate minus consumption rate equals the accumulation rate or the rate of change of mass in the system with time. Since we are looking at the steady state situation, this is 0, we will call this 1.3 dash 3. Now, we do an oxygen balance, this is the mass balance that we are going to do or we are going to apply this equation to the oxygen species. We blindly look at R i minus R o plus R g minus R c equals 0. The molar flow rate of oxygen in the inlet minus the molar flow rate of oxygen in the outlet plus the molar flow rate of oxygen that is generated this term minus the molar flow rate of oxygen consumed this term equals 0. I thought uh, let me show this and then ask you to write something else rather than ask you to write something right away. So, this is the application of the mass balance equation to oxygen. We know that there is no oxygen that is generated in the system due to any reaction there is no oxygen that is consumed in the system due to any reaction maybe and therefore, the molar flow rate of oxygen in the inlet minus the molar flow rate of oxygen in the outlet equals 0. From whatever we have already seen, we have already seen that the molar flow rate of oxygen in uh, the air stream is 0 0.21 times the molar flow rate of air and we also know the other things from that the molar flow rate of oxygen in the inlet is 0 0.21 times the molar flow rate of air. The molar flow rate of oxygen in the outlet stream, the product stream is 0 0.05 times the molar flow rate of the product stream input minus output from the system that is a humidifier that is 0. So, this is you could write molar flow rate of uh, the product stream is 0 0.21 divided by 0 0.05 of the molar flow rate of air. This is what we get from that balance. Now, I would like you to do a total mole balance. Okay. Take all the moles of the species, all the moles of the species and do a balance. Okay. Let me give you some time, do the balance and then let me show you the balance. Take maybe about 3, 4 minutes and then do the balance. Let us see what you get. Go ahead. Hopefully, you got something like this. When you consider the total number of moles, there is no generation or consumption. Okay, mass can neither be created nor destroyed. 
Therefore, the balance simply becomes the total molar rate n minus the total molar rate out. This is again written on the system. Balance would make sense only in the system that it is written equals 0. The total molar rate is through the moles of air and the moles of water. Those are the two input streams. The total molar rate out is through the product stream that is only output stream equals 0 equation 1.3 dash 4. From whatever we know the molar flow rate of air is this the molar flow rate of water is 1 and the molar flow rate of the product stream is 0 0.21 divided by 0 0.05 times the molar flow rate of air this is what we got in this step right here and all this we are substituting here to get the molar flow rate of air is if you do this calculation you have only molar flow rate of air as the variable here. So, 1 minus 0 0.21 by 0 0.05 um, equals minus 1 here you work things out then you will get molar flow rate of air to be 0 0.31 mole per minute. So, that is the needed answer this is a typical design situation you want to know um, what is the molar flow rate of air to be fed for the humidifier to work uh, appropriately. This is a design operation question uh, uh, an input uh, quantity that we need and that we could easily get by using the material balance principle or doing mass balances that is how powerful it is. Okay. So, you need to know this. Um, what I will do is I think I will stop here yes I, let me stop here for this lecture. When we come back let me show you the application of the material balance principle to a microscopic system such as a cell which is of relevance to biological systems. Okay. Hopefully, you have been having fun in the course so far it will be mathematical there is a certain need for uh, mathematics to come in uh, because it makes it very gentle. We saw that you know when we talk in terms of conserved quantities it makes it gives you tools that are so gentle. Mathematics is something that is very gentle you put it in a mathematical context then it becomes applicable to pretty much a large variety of situations and that is why we take the mathematical route. There is a typical question asked by many students why so much mathematics this is the reason why we would like to look at it from a mathematical point of view. You put it in a mathematical plane then it becomes more gently applicable it has a very nice set of rules consistent set of rules and so on and so forth. So, we are very clear as to what we are doing in the mathematical plane and whatever we can get out of that is the clarity that we need for design and operation. If we can do that it is much better okay, that is the reason why we take the mathematical route fine go ahead take a break then when we come back to the next lecture we will go forward with the application to microscopic systems see you then.